I have Roger McNamee on beam. Roger, we're ready for you. Whoa. He's, gonna <laughs> He's running his own beam. All right. Roger is in the CNN studio in Stanford. And he needs to talk to us on the clock because CNN is waiting for him. However, he said that Toronto comes first. He'll explain because he also says that Toronto is ground zero for what he describes as the Facebook catastrophe. It's already on the New York Times bestselling list. It's called Zucked Yes, just like that other word with an F in front of it. Roger, we're spellbound and waiting to hear from you. I am excited to be here in Toronto. Wow, this is really fantastic. You guys are getting the best of me. There's nothing better than having me very far away. I'm really excited to be back in Toronto. I've been to your lovely city a couple times since my book came out, and it's just fantastic to be here with you again. So I want you to understand that I spent my entire professional life in Silicon Valley. I've been a true believer in technology since 1982. And I got to be honest with you, I never expected to find myself criticizing the industry or the people that I love. But that is where we are. When I first met Mark Zuckerberg in 2006, he had just turned 22 years old. Facebook was only two years old. They only had 9 million users. They were all high school and college students. It required authenticated identity, which meant there were no trolls. There were no bad actors. They had really good privacy controls, which I thought were central for the success of the company. So the day that I met Mark, I was already convinced that Facebook would be bigger than Google was at that time, which is to say it was going to be the next big thing. The challenge for Mark was to make that dream come true. And my role was very simple. At the beginning, I helped him solve a crisis that kept the company independent. And over the ensuing three years, the years that I was a mentor to them, I provided him with lots of advice on building his team. And the core person he brought in was someone who was very important to me, the former chief of staff to the US Secretary of the Treasury, Sheryl Sandberg. I really loved Facebook, and as it grew, I, I just believed it was always going to be a force for good. Now, I'm a professional analyst, and there were signals along the way that I should have and could have caught, but I missed them. Until early 2016, when all of a sudden, I started to see things going on on Facebook that I knew were not consistent with my very rosy vision of what that company should be. Specifically, I saw issues in the Democratic primary in the state of New Hampshire in January 2016 that were completely inauthentic. It said to me there was something about Facebook groups that could be harmful for democracy. Then in March of 2016, Facebook expelled a corporation for using its advertising tools to identify people who were interested in Black Lives Matter and they were selling those identities to police departments. It was a clear civil rights violation. Then in June 2016, the United Kingdom voted on whether or not to leave the European Union, what we now call Brexit. That was the first time that I realized that Facebook's advertising tool could be used in an election to distort the outcome, that they conveyed an unfair advantage to the campaign with the more inflammatory message. And I gotta be honest with you, these three things really took my breath away. This rosy view I had of what Facebook was, was being undone before my eyes. 
And I went to look for allies to see if anybody saw the world the same way I did. And it took months. Finally, in September, the, the blog Recode gave me a chance to write an op-ed to describe what I saw. But before I published it, we had more events, more civil rights violations, and the news that the Russians were interfering in the U.S. election. So I reached out to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg with my concerns that the fundamental business model and algorithms of Facebook allowed bad actors to harm innocent people. Now, they got right back to me, but they dismissed my concern, really as though it was a public relations problem, not a business problem. I spent the ensuing three months begging Facebook to look at this differently. They said to me, Roger, we don't have a problem. The law says that we're a platform, not a media company. So we're not responsible for what third parties do. And I explained, no, you're in a trust business. You need to do what Johnson & Johnson, the pharmaceutical company, did in 1982 when a madman put poison in bottles of towel. He killed a whole bunch of people. And the CEO of Johnson & Johnson withdrew every bottle of Tylenol from every retail shelf in America without being asked. And I said, that's what Facebook needs to do. And I spent three months pleading with my friends to do that. And when they did, I was faced with a choice. I could sit back and just let someone else deal with it. Or I could accept the fact that I was partially responsible, that I'd played a small but important role in the company's early days. I'd made money. My investors had made a lot of money. So I realized it was my turn. I needed to become an activist. I needed to share with the world what I knew. And let me tell you what it is that I know. It's not just about Facebook. It's about Google. It's increasingly about Amazon and Microsoft. It's about a business model that the Harvard professor Shoshana Zuboff characterizes as surveillance capital. It begins with appeals to the portions of our psyche that are so fundamental we can't resist them. Our need for rewards, our need for social approval, validation, our need for social reciprocity. They do this with notification. Hey, join my network on LinkedIn. You've been tagged in a photograph. Or 47 people liked your post. We cannot help but respond. And we respond over and over again because they send us lots of notifications. They're trying to build a habit. For most of us, habits tip over into addiction. And people say, Roger, how do I know if I'm addicted? And I say the test is simple. When do you check your smartphone first thing in the morning? Is it before you pee? <laughs> or while you're peeing? <laughs> So they get us addicted, and then they need to get us engaged. And the algorithms are very specifically tuned to reinforce the things that cause us to react emotionally, to share, to comment, to do things like that. And it turns out that the best way to do that, the thing that is most common to all of us, is to appeal to our flight or fight nature, to go and give us hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy theory. Now, they don't give us that because they want to spread hate speech or disinformation. They, they do it because the algorithms promote the stuff that animates us. And that is the stuff we cannot help but react to. And in an election contest, this is incredibly dangerous because it increases polarization. It isolates people in their own filter bubble. Effectively, each one of us has our own Truman Show with our own facts. And in the United States, 40% of the people identify with at least one issue that is demonstrably false. Think about climate change or flat earth or the relationship, supposed relationship between vaccines and autism. 
All of these things are demonstrably false. Yet people identify with them in such a way that you cannot communicate. And as a result, democracy is undermined because we can't have a debate. Now, the problem goes way beyond that. It affects our children in really profound ways. It delays the transition from adolescence to adulthood. It affects our ability to make choices without fear. What is conventionally called privacy. And it affects competition and innovation. And all of these things come from a business model that Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance politics. It starts with this notion of collecting all the data that is out there. We think our relationship with Facebook or our relationship with Google is that we give up a little bit of personal data for a great service. But that's not really what's going on. Google identified an idea that now Facebook shares and increasingly Microsoft and Amazon share. And that is that democracy is terribly innovative. And if only they can convert all human experience into data, they can make the world operate so much better. Well, the problem with that, of course, is they're taking away choices. They're taking away free will. And the brilliance of Professor Zuboff's thesis is that it explains so much of what is going on. That little bit of data we put in is maybe one-tenth of one percent of what they have. They've created a data voodoo doll by tracking us relentlessly online, by buying data from banks, credit card processors, cellular companies, and everybody who will sell it, affinity cards, websites, you name it. Google scans emails and presumably documents. You have companies that have products like Alexa or Google Home or Facebook's portal that do surveillance inside our house. Ring on the outside of our house. That massive surveillance creates a data voodoo doll that is not only a digital representation of us, it is a way to manipulate our behavior. And the reason they can do that is that they are using that to influence the search results and the news feed that dominate our life online. We trust the information we see in search results. We trust the information we see in our news feed. And what we don't realize is that it has been sculpted based on our data booty doll to produce outcomes that are favorable to the platform, whether it would be Facebook, Google, or one of the others. They, they're in the business of giving their customers, who are marketers, perfect information about us, right? You've all had that experience of thinking something out loud and then immediately seeing an ad for it online and thinking, how did that happen? That's the data voodoo doll at work. And they sell access to that data voodoo doll to anyone who wants to buy it. And it's not about targeting. It's about providing the exact perfect message at the perfect moment in time. Google can now identify that women are pregnant before they know. They've identified when is the moment in the purchase of a car, when you decide to buy a car, when do you decide the brand, when do you decide the model, when do you buy insurance, and they sell that certainty. And then you ask yourself, how does that look online? Imagine the experience of Google Maps. You wake up in the morning, and let's say that you have your commute programmed into Google Maps, so that every day it tells you whether you should take your standard route or maybe a different route. Now, Google would tell you this is called load balancing. They need to move people around the route in order to keep everything moving smoothly. But I would point out that in that context, Google is playing God. And maybe it's okay in the context of Google Maps, but we need to think about the fact that they want to play God everywhere because they think democracy and free will are inefficient. And it's not because they're bad people, they just have a different philosophy. And the problem from my perspective is that we've never had a conversation about it. 
And this is terribly important because Google is doing this in every part of their business. It started with Google Maps. If you think about Waze, Waze does the same thing, but with a different business model. Because the business model of Waze is based on restaurants and stores paying them to have you go by their location. So your routes are increasingly influenced by what they know about you from your data voodoo doll. So you're not necessarily being taken on the optimal route. So your purpose to get your information quickly is not their purpose. Their purpose is to have you go by people who pay them. Then think about Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go began its life as something called Google Glass. You remember Google Glass? People wandering around with glasses with a little computer screen? Remember what we called them? We called them glass holes. <laughs> they looked incredibly dorky. And the, the reason that the product failed was because the glasses looked dorky. But from Google's point of view, the glasses were really important because what they were trying to do is to convert human experience into data along the lines of what Professor Zuboff talks about. And when they do that, what they were using is the camera on there to capture facial recognition of everyone the Google Glass holder encountered. They were tracking every motion they took, every move they made, and turning it into data. That failed, so they went back into the lab and repackaged it as a video game. They spun it out as a separate company. The company was called Niantic. The game was called Pokemon Go. And the next thing you knew, one billion people were wandering around with a phone in front of their face, capturing all of their human behaviors, capturing facial recognition of everyone they met. And you sit there and think about what they did next. They ran a behavioral modification experiment. Could they get you to knock on a stranger's door to get a Pokemon? Yes, you could. Could they get you to climb over a fence? Yes, they could. Now, if they put a Pokemon at Starbucks because Starbucks paid them, could they get you to buy coffee? Yes, they could. Now, Toronto is ground zero for what is the equivalent of the moon landing for this experiment that Google has been conducting. They're effectively creating the matrix, right? It's a place where democracy is replaced by algorithmic process, where they capture all of the data, where they convert all human experience into data that they control, and they then manage things for maximum efficiency. And I don't want to make the point that that is wrong. I want to make the point that that is not something that anyone, and particularly not the citizens of Toronto, should enter into without a really thoughtful and honest discussion of what the trade-offs are. It is not reasonable to give up civic governance in exchange for better data on traffic flow. That is insane. What I think you have to do, and again, you don't need to listen to me, but what I would recommend is that you imagine that whatever Google is telling you today is just the first step. You know, the network they're building has a range that goes far beyond the waterfront. They're clearly planning that the waterfront is for them a beachhead and that they would like to expand beyond the the limits of that particular project, that they would like to have the opportunity to gather all of this data that goes through their system, to control and monetize it. And I believe they have asked you to protect them from politics. They don't want to be part of politics. And my answer is, that is a decision that all of the citizens of Toronto need to make, that the citizens of Canada need to make, that the citizens of the world need to make. And we need to make it with full information. And I would really ask you to go online and watch the testimony of Professor Zuboff from Ottawa when she was before 
the Grand Commission. She is a brilliant person, a brilliant scholar, who articulates what the risks are that we're dealing with. When there is a risk that someone is trying to implement the matrix, you don't want to wait until they put it in place before you have the conversation. You need to have it while there's still time. And my point to you is this is something all of you get to decide. This is not up to me. My job is simply to make you aware that there's a risk to it. And I want you to understand that I think the people of Google are good people. They just look at the world differently than I do. And I just want to give all of you a chance to make your own choices and to make the right choice for yourselves, for your children, and for all of Canada. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I want to wish you the best and good luck. Feel free to follow up with me anytime you wish. Thank you. Roger, Roger, how are you doing for time? I'm, I'm enjoying this so much. You guys are the best. I have, to, I have time to do some Q&A if you want. Can we have a question or two? I would love to have a question or two. All right. So you gave us a form of advice that we should be informed, we should ask, we should insist on the conversation. Do you have anything tougher to suggest? Well, I would like to believe that the answer relative to internet platforms like Facebook, Google, and increasingly Amazon and Microsoft, is that we need to do two things. We need to create a competitive alternative. We need different kinds of business models that aren't so exploitative. And in order to do that, there are, is a tool set available to government called antitrust law. And in the United States, we've begun at the very beginning stages to think about antitrust as a solution. The European Union is further along. That is very, very important. But it only addresses one of the four problems, which is competition. For the other three problems, which are public health, democracy, and privacy, we need to actually unwind the surveillance capitalist business model that Professor Zuboff describes. And in order to do that, I think you have to simply step back and look at what's going on there. We did not understand years ago that our personal data could be used to manipulate us. So we were worried about identity theft. We were worried about somebody stealing our credit card. It never occurred to us that somebody could know us so well that they could manipulate our behavior. And so we allowed them to take all this data. I believe this is like the chemical industry in 1950. These companies are creating huge external costs to society, and they are not bearing those costs. So they're artificially profitable. The way the chemical industry was, when it poured mercury, chromium, and other byproducts into fresh water, when they left mine tailings on the side of hills. And eventually, society forced them to pay those costs. And in this case, I think we need to do the same thing. And the way to do that is to ask this question. Why is it legitimate for internet companies to track you online? Why is it legitimate for banks or credit card companies or uh, cellular companies or anybody to make commercial use of personal data that they either acquire or trade for? Why is it legal for Google and others to scan emails or documents for commercial gain? And why is it legal to capture data from systems like Alexa and to take it to a central place and use it for commercial gain later on? Why is any of that legitimate? Professor Zuboff says this is a lot like child labor, which was a debate in 1900. The debate was, do you let children work five hours a day or eight hours a day? And then eventually somebody walked in and said, wait a minute, the correct number is zero. And that is the correct number here as well. I believe none of that data should be used by third party. The tracking should be illegal, scanning of documents should be illegal. And then once we've made it illegal, then we can have the debate about which uses are legitimate and which are not. But this is a civil rights matter, 
where the most disadvantaged people in society are further disadvantaged by all of this. And I just think that terribly unfair. Roger, one last question. Okay. Fire. All right. So you've talked about the pusher, about the company that finds, aggregates, and creates this product. You've only made glancing mention of the people and the companies who buy this product. And last year when we began this conversation about the promise and peril of this digital life we're in, I asked the senior official of a major advertising agency who buys this stuff. If there weren't buyers for this stuff, they wouldn't be making this stuff. So the issue on that in my mind is that we're dealing with addiction. So we as consumers are the victims of a technology that is pervasive in our lives that is designed to exploit the weakest elements in our psychology. There is an analogous thing going on with marketing. Because these companies provide perfect information, they have transformed marketing. And that is incredibly addictive. It's made life so much easier for marketers. And keep in mind, no individual marketer has even 1% market share. So nobody has enough leverage. And that, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, is the challenge we face. It's not just that companies don't have enough leverage. Governments don't have enough leverage. Unless we are prepared to shut these guys down temporarily, there is literally nothing we can do to change their behavior. They have demonstrated over the last two or three years that they are immune to appeals to their civic virtue, right? They're, they're willing to undermine democracy in a dozen countries. They're immune to the moral argument that the deaths of thousands of people in Myanmar, in the Philippines, of hundreds of people in Sri Lanka, of 50 people in New Zealand, of nine people in Pittsburgh, and lots of other examples. They're completely immune to viewing that they have any responsibility for that. They're totally untroubled by the damage to our children. And I believe all of that has told me that you only can change this by changing their incentives. And the best way to change their incentives is to realize that they are not in control, that governments have the final say, that the people have the final say. You should not be worried about losing access to services you like. All of these things can be replaced and very quickly. And I think in reality, these companies will continue to offer the services no matter what they say. But that is the challenge. And the point is, are we always going to choose convenience, even when convenience means a loss of freedom and a loss of, of self-determination? That's the challenge we face. Roger, we all want to thank you very much for this. Well, I want to thank you. I've never been a robot before, but I'm told that I have very robotic features, and so I'm really excited to test it out in person. That's splendid. I hope you can see the crowd.